Okay, Alejandro, are you ready? Yeah, we're good. All right. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for being here today. This is our first seminar series of the 23-24 school year, um, and it's just really nice to see everybody in the room. This is a hybrid event, so we have folks online as well. Um, thank you very much for those that are online and are joining us. Um, because we are a hybrid event, that means a couple of things for us. There are some new faces in the room, so I'm just going to talk through some things. For folks online, if you have any questions for our our speaker today, please put them into the chat box. We have a volunteer in the room, Roseanne. Hi, Roseanne. Um, she's going to read those questions out to the room uh, when we get to the question and answer section. Um, and then our speaker today will be able to answer them. For folks in the room, um, you need a mic for the folks online to be able to hear. So you've got a couple of options when you have a question. If you raise your hand at the end of today's talk, I will run around with this mic and make sure that you get it and you can ask your questions. There's also also a mic stand over on the side of the room. You're welcome to go to that mic and ask your question there. That way everybody can participate in today's presentation. Um, also wanted to remind folks, if you are new to this series, there is a sign-up sheet outside. The only reason I have you sign up is to make sure that I justify that I didn't buy the cookies for myself. Um, so if you haven't already, please sign up. That would be great. Okay, I um, wanted to make just a couple of really quick announcements. Um, we will not have a seminar next week, but we will have one again on September 28th when Mac Matt Hawkyard, who is a past postdoc here at HMSC, is going to be coming from Maine and speaking to us about aquaculture, fin fish nutrition, and feeding technology. So please come back and see uh, what he's got to present to us. The other thing we have going on that's right around the corner is on October 4th, we have our next Science on Tap with Katerina Alden, who is going to be talking about the discovery of a whale nursery and how it transformed a community. Um, those events are in the evening. They start here at six, but we have a social hour for an hour before. So please join us there. If you need to know any more information about any of these kind of events, uh, you can just go to the HMSC homepage and go to the events page and all the information you need to be able to join those either on site or remotely will be there. But the reason you're all here is for today's speaker. So I'm going to hand this mic off to the individual who invited today's speaker to join us. Thank you, Cinnamon. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alejandro Acevedo Gutierrez. Dr. Acevedo Gutierrez was born and raised in Mexico City. He and his siblings are first-generation college students. He, had, he attended the Universidad Autónoma de Baja California Sur in La Paz, Mexico, where he earned a licenciatura, the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in marine biology. He then attended Texas A&M University, working with Dr. Bern Versig to earn his PhD, where he studied bottlenose dolphins and sharks off Isla del Coco, Costa Rica, after first studying the social behavior of bottlenose dolphins in Dolfo Delce, also in Costa Rica. He completed his postdoc at the University of California in Santa Cruz, where he studied the feeding behavior of blue whales and fin whales. And thanks to Dr. Versig's recommendation, Alejandro participated in an IMAX movie, Dolphins. He was uh, filming in the Bahamas and Argentina attending conferences in New York and Sydney, doing voiceovers and receiving lessons in public speaking in Los Angeles, and giving talks and interviews to museums, schools, TV, and radio stations across the United States and Mexico, which were all eye-opening experiences for him. The film was nominated for an Academy Award, and it was these experiences that pointed him in the direction of science education and a job at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. Alejandro is now based in Bellingham at Western Washington University. As a professor in biology and science education, he studies harbor seals and sea lions. He has participated in two sabbaticals, the first in New Zealand studying fur seals and the second in Germany studying harbor porpoise. 
Alejandro's main interest is in the role of marine mammals in their environment and their interactions with humans. In collaboration with colleagues at West, or in collaboration with colleagues and students from Western University, he aims to examine the impact of individual harbor seals on the community and particularly salmon consumption. Western students are also describing the variation in the numbers of seals hauled out in downtown Bellingham and the foraging behavior of seals at Whatcom Creek. And with that, I will turn it over to Alejandro. Want to do a little sound check with us, Alejandro? You betcha. Thank you, Rene. Can you hear me? Everybody here okay? Everybody says yes, Alejandro. I'm going to turn Thank off you. our Thank mic. Thank you, and... for my life just flew by. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you folks for inviting me to share with you some of our results regarding the foraging ecology of harbor seals in the Salish Sea. The Salish Sea, oops. Oh, the Salish Sea comprises the inland marine waters of Washington State and British Columbia. So these waters are Georgia Strait in Canada, Juan de Fuca Strait in between Canada and the United States and the Puget Sound and marine water surrounding the San Juan Islands in the United States. So the land and water of this sea had been inhabited for a long time by First Nation people. Their names shown here on, on this map. And if you want to know the names of the first inhabitants of any land really in the world, I recommend this uh, website, the native land. So for example, here in Bellingham, we live in the traditional lands of the Lummi Nation, the Nooksack Indian tribe, and the Upper Skagit Indian tribe. Um, and learning more about these tribes, I've discovered cool endeavors, such as the Children of the Setting Sun Productions, which is a media company that follows the Lummi family tradi tradition and specializes in Coast Salish storytelling, or White Swan Environmental, which advocates for the restoration of the Salish Sea for seven generations and believe in the integration of respect of Western science and Shalangan, meaning the way of life in the Lummi language. So the point is that the Salish Sea and coastal ecosystems cultivate a strong sense of place and cultural identity for both native and non-native groups. In this regard, Chinook salmon are an iconic species that fulfill critical ecosystem roles and contribute to the cultural identity of the Pacific Northwest. Of the salmon species present on the west coast of North America, Chinook salmon are the largest and most valuable by weight, having a massive economic influence through lucrative commercial and recreational fishing. Since before Western colonization, native tribes in the Salish Sea have relied on salmon for <clears throat> subsistence living and have played a crucial role in the ecosystem management of this species. Today, the 20 treaty Indian tribes in Washington state are co-managers of the Chinook fishery stock within the state. Further, management of the Chinook salmon is also important because they are critical to southern resident killer whales, a population that is also iconic and endangered. Chinook salmon in the Salish Sea see have declined in abundance despite decreasing the numbers taken by commercial, recreational, and tribal fisheries. As this graph shows, the total abundance of Chinook salmon in the Salish Sea since the 1984 have declined. <clears throat> that is, number of Chinook caught plus number of Chinook returning to Salish Sea rivers. For almost 40 years, this decline has been going on, although the decline has not been as dramatic for the past 20 years. Although many factors have contributed to this decline, such as infectious diseases, habitat degradation, climate change and predation, overfishing is one of the main culprits. In North America, many marine mammal populations have increased in abundance since the mid 20th century, when federal protections were implemented in the United States, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and in Canada, the Fisheries Act, but in the early 1970s, pinnipeds such as seals and sea lions have exhibited 
some of the fastest recoveries with some populations increasing by an order of magnitude in abundance since protection from culling and hunting, and with many populations to be believed near carrying capacity. In this regard, numbers of the most widespread and abundant marine mammal species in the Salish Sea, the harbor seal, increased exponentially between the early 1970s and the late 90s and stabilized for the past 20 years. So the graph shows numbers of harbor seals for two stocks in the U.S. Sally Sea, the northern inland stock and the southern Puget Sound. These trends are impressive from a conservation point of view. However, recent research on the foraging of harbor seals has raised concern that increased predation could be contributing to the declines or at least to the lack of recovery of numerous fish stocks of high commercial importance and our conservation status, including Chinook salmon. Such concerns generated interest in the predation by pinnipeds on salmon species in the region. For instance, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife asked the Washington State Academy of Sciences to examine the scientific basis for the concern that recovery of salmon populations in Washington State Salish Sea and outer coastal waters has been impeded by pinniped predation. A major finding from the report is that further characterization of pinniped behavior and diet and development and refinement of models are not likely to lead to robust conclusions about the role of pinniped predation in the depression of Washington state salmon populations. Accordingly, providing concrete answers to the question that motivated the report, are pinnipeds currently impeding the recovery of salmon will require robust adaptive man management approaches that experimentally change pinniped populations at spatial and temporal scales that are meaningfully impact to the ecosystem. Regardless of the state of our knowledge on this question, calls for the management of pinnipeds in the Sally Sea have become increasingly louder and numerous across all sectors of society. Unfortunately, it is not just about management the species. Chinook salmon actually comprise many evolutionary significant units, each of which needs to be managed independently. The map here shows the distribution, different colors of the naturally spawning evolutionary significant units of Chinook salmon in the Puget Sound, all of which are still well below the planning ranges for recovery escapement levels. Most populations are also consistently below the spawner recruit levels identified as consistent with recovery. And most populations have also declined persistently over the past seven to 10 years. There are also artificially spawning evolutionary significant units, bringing, bringing the current total just in the Puget Sound, so just in this area, to 22 extant evolutionary significant units each of which needs to be managed independently. At the same time, we're learning that some marine mammal species viewed as generalists may actually be a mixture of individual specialists. That is, individuals consuming more of a prey species than the average individual in the population. The first and most complete work on individual specialization with marine mammals has been conducted on sea otters. However, dye data in the Sally Sea first supported the hypothesis that harbor seals may also comprise individual specialists. Since then, studies using stable isotopes and fatty acids provide further support to this hypothesis, including the presence of substantial individual heterogeneity in the diet, and that females derive more of their carbon from near shore versus offshore food webs than males. An explanation that is also supported by movement data of tax seals in the region. More recently, molecular analysis of diet from two whole outside show that male and female diets consistently differ. Females consume more demersal fish species, whereas males consume more salmonid species. So given the calls to manage harbor seals as one of the approaches employed to recover Chinook salmon, Yet given the existence of many Chinook evolutionary scientific significant units that need to be recovered and the apparent differential prey consumption between male and female harbor seals, 
How can findings of the foraging ecology of the harbor seals inform management of Chinook salmon in the Salish Sea? So here, I should acknowledge my collaborator, Dr. Dietmar Schwartz, a professor of biology at Western Washington University and a molecular ecologist and geneticist. Dietmar had um, been working with insects before we started collaborating in 2016. And since then, it has been a tremendous collaboration. I pretty sure I got more out of all this collaboration that he has gotten, but I'm extremely grateful for this collaboration that, that it keeps, keeps on going. So to help figure out how findings on the foraging ecology of harbor seals can inform management of Chinook salmon in the Salish Sea, I want to share with you the results of two projects. In the first project, we combined two molecular techniques to describe call-out use and preconsumption of male and female harbor seals. We inquire if the previous findings regarding diet differences between males and females observed at two haul-out sites were applicable across the Salish Sea. The processing and analysis of the data was led by Holland Conwell, a recently graduated major from Western Washington, a biology major from Western Washington University. Holland is now working in a molecular research lab at the University of California in Santa Cruz. So to investigate the sex-specific dietary differences and sex ratios, we process harbor seal scat collected across the Salish Sea and analyze scat samples with a combination of DNA metabarcoding of prey species and molecular sex identification of the deposit and seal. So let me describe the methods. The harbor um, seal scat samples used in this study were a subset of a scat sample collection from two studies conducted along Georgia Strait in Canada and the Puget Sound in the United States. We use data collected from 13 holout sites between 2012 and 2018. Out of these 13 holout sites, nine sites have uh, over 100 samples and were considered well sampled. The collection period was timed to correspond with juvenile salmon out migrations and adult salmon spawning. The collection of SCAD yielded uh, three different explanatory factors, 13 holout sites, two seasons and seven years. And from the SCAD, we determined the sex of about 80% of samples using a modified published assay that targets paralogous on both the X and Y chromosomes via quantitative polymerase change reaction. I have to look up with what parallax means. Parallax are two genes or clusters of genes at different chromosomal locations in the same organism that have structural or similarities indicating that they derive from a common ancestor from a common ancestral gene. Um, I looked that up, I read it to you, I'm still puzzled, but so I'm just glad that Dietmar collaborates with me. In any case, this assay yielded the two level explanatory factor sex. From SCAD, we also determined the use of the whole side by each sex. Because we were interested in local variability in sex ratio, we calculated the proportions of males in each monthly sample and use generalized linear models to explain the observed variation. We thus had the variable holout male proportion. Seal diet <clears throat> had been determined from the SCAD by a prior study using quantitative DNA metamark coding. In combination with the sex of the SCAD depositor obtained in this study, it allows to describe the diet of males and females. And we normalize this DNA sequence reads as proportions and analyze differences in preconsumption at the order level with a permutational multivariate analysis of variance or permanova. And we also describe differences in preconsumption at the species level. So overall, the sex ratio was one female to 1.02 males but show notable spatial temporal variation. The graph shows the number of harbor seal scat samples on the left axis from 2012 to 2018. Each row representing a year from 2012 to 2018, skip in 2015, I have no idea why, and across different months of the year, in which is the X axis within columns. Each column 
represents one of the 13 holout sites sampled in the Salish Sea. The red orange color indicates numbers of samples assigned to a female. In the blue color indicates number of samples assigned to a male. Hence, differences in color show biases in sex ratio among sites. For example, Goodwar Bay here had about five times as many females as males. Comparison of generalized linear mixed models indicate that whole outside was a useful predictor of variation in harvestable sex ratios. Whole outside explain about 16% of the variation in sex ratio while adding year and season to the model only explain an additional 1% of the variation in sex ratio. Out of the well sample whole outsides, Commencement Bay, Coachan Bay, Cuts Area and Fraser River had about two to three times as many males and females. So Commencement Bay and Cuts Area are in Southern Puget Sound, Coachan Bay and Fraser River are in um, Georgia Strait. So the graph shows DNA harbor seal diet fraction on the X axis as average relative reef abundance. And on the Y axis, each prey species. The left graph shows results from female scats, the right graph from male scats. The male harbor seals ate more of the five salmon species than females. Chinook salmon, this, comprise almost three times more than consumption by females and chum salmon comprise almost two times more of the average male harbor seal diet than the average female diet. As in the previous slide, we show in on the x-axis DNA harbor seal diet fraction as average relative rate abundance, but this time the y-axis shows the taxonomic order of the prey species of the prey. The left graph shows again female scat, the right graph shows male scat. The most abundant prey orders, that is gaddy forms, mainly Pacific hay and wildlife pollock, and clupe forms, Pacific herring and northern anchovy, uh, did not differ much in the average diet of males and females. However, Salmoniforms were about 2.6 times more abundant in the diet of males than in the diet of females. Females also consume a large portion of the mersal species, such as sculpins, in the order Scorpaniformes, Shiner serperge in the order Persiformes, and plain fin midshipmen in the order Batracoidiformes. Um, I learned to say this in Spanish, so um, excuse me if I'm just kind of saying in Spanish, you know, a super Spanish accent here. Um, all of these orders, all of the species and disorders do prey on salmon, eggs, and juveniles. So a permanova of the 10 prey orders with a mean relative breed abundance over 0.01 revealed that sex was a significant factor driving the overall diet differences. Underscoring special variability, whole outside explain the most dietary variation compared to other factors tested in each permanova. So the graphs here show the female and male diet composition in the Salish Sea by order, but based on relative read abundance as the other graph. However, in this case, we're looking at female dominated whole outsides and male dominated whole outsides. So let's begin with the left graph. Shows the two well sample female dominated whole outsides, Nisqually, which is found in the southern Puget Sound along with Woodward Bay. The y axis shows the diet proportion and the x axis the month for each side. The top row shows female diet and the bottom row shows male diet. Female diet, this whole outsize was similar and mostly composed on. Clupe forms, pink. Um, my wife says that I'm colorblind, so I guess that will be fuchsia or a fancy name like that, but it's this one, the clupe forms. Um, the batracoide forms, blue. So all these are um, um, herring and the blues for the batracoide forms. The scorpiniforms forms here in light green. 
and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, for the males, where minority of this whole out size, but similar diet to females, um, aside from more flat um, salmon, the purple here, gaudy forms dark blue, uh, clupe forms here in pink, and flat fish is here in light black. Here in the squally, they have a, a, a different diet from females. The right graph shows the four well sample male dominated whole out size commencement bay, Cowichan Bay, Cuts area, and Fraser River. And male diet at this whole out size was comparable with larger emphasis on, again, clue by forms, the herrings and the anchovies here in pink, the gaudy forms in dark blue, the walleyes and pollock and the hake. And the salmoniforms here of the salmon in purple. The scorpioniforms, like green, excuse me, are also heavy feature in the area of males at Cots area. Fraser River stands out as the whole outside with most uh, consumption of, of salmonids. It's just dominant prey species for both males and toward the, the fall for, for females. So our data suggests that male harvest seal diet contains more salmon than female harvest seal diet in the Salish Sea. Yet this finding should be prefaced by noting that the actual impact of males on salmon on any given hull outside likely varies based on the sex ratio at that side. So male harvest seals may be exerting strong predation pressure on salmon at male dominated sites but male harvest seals found at female skewed hull out size or at hull out size with an even sex ratio may not be of larger impact on salmon than females. So as such, based on sex ratio and presence in the diet, we identify three predation hotspots, Cowichan Bay, Cuts Area, and Fraser River. So as mentioned before, so, in a prior study, given the small sexual dimorphism between female and male harbor seals and the consumption of adult salmon by females, the latter might be able to pursue adult salmon but are limited to do so by caring for their offspring during summer and fall. Those differences in reproductive biology between the exact species help explain our results. This explanation also fits with the recent finding that females show more specialization than males, particularly during summer and fall, in relation to the consumption of the mersal and benthic prey species, suggesting that this type of prey likely requires specific foraging strategies as well. So while males consume more salmon, females may actually be benefiting salmonic conditions by preying on salmon predators, as has been previously speculated. This potential scenario poses issues for management, since male and female harbor seals may be having opposing effects on threatened salmon at certain hull sites. While male and female predation may even out in the Salish Sea as a whole, and at whole out size with a sex ratio close to one to one, local salmon runs at whole out size that are male skewed or female skewed may experience different situations. And remember the Chinook, the Chinook salmon are managed based on the evolutionary significant units, not as one single species. As such, male dominated whole out sites may require increased monitoring of harvest seal predation and of salmon response to such predation. So the prior study on foraging ecology harbor seal suggests focusing on specific size for management action, but how to manage these sites of concern. The report prepared by the Washington State Academy of Sciences also reviewed potential management actions, which fall into two main categories, lethal and non-lethal removal of harbor seals. Examples of lethal removals will be large-scale calls or targeted removals of male harbor seals or individual salmon specialists. An example of non-lethal removal will be sterilization or harassment with acoustic deterrent devices, all of which have varying degrees of success. However, another non-lethal removal strategy proposed is the removal of artificial hull outsides. The logic behind the solution is that seals forage from their hull outside and it's reasonable to assume that a hull outside adjacent to a creek where salmon return will have plenty of seals coming to feed. Hence, removing those artificial hull outside should result in a decrease of salmon predation. So unfortunately, not much is known about the success of this solution. 
Hence, the Washington State Academy of Sciences recommended conducting an experiment with artificial holab to removal to describe if such removal will drive seals out of the area and away from salmon habitat. It just so happens that the recommended experiment has been occurring in downtown Bellingham, where undergrad students at Western Washington University have been monitoring seal numbers at an artificial holab site, a log boom, since 2007 and have witnessed the removal of, the removal of said boom. So therefore, the second project uses a natural experiment to determine if the removal of artificial holab sites is enough to deter seals from foraging or returning salmon. To conduct the study, we analyze long-term data on harvest seal occurrence in downtown Bellingham. So Bellingham is located on the northwest corner of Washington State. It is a relatively small city that houses the main campus of Western Washington University. It's out of the picture, it will be under the Google sign. Um, however, this photo does show downtown Bellingham, as well as the waterfront along Whatcom Waterway and Whatcom Creek, which the Port of Bellingham is, both of the, all this waterfront is being renovated by the Port of Bellingham. The creek also houses the Watkins Creek hatchery, which maintains populations of Chinook and Chum salmon that run between late September and early December. The Chinook population was established in 2018 by the hatchery to provide critical food sources to southern resident killer whales, releasing about 1 million smalt each spring. So here's another view of a closer view of that area, showing the two sites used by harbor seals to log out the log pond here and the pier. There are some pilings here where uh, the seals haul out, as well as the foraging site at the creek right under the creek sign, because the hatchery is just right under the creek sign. So along the southeast side of the waterfront lies Georgia Pacific's former pulp chemical plant and tissue mill, which is the site of this downtown uh, development in Bellingham. So given the small size of the area, both seals haul out and seals foraging are easily observable. We're talking about, depending on the tide, 20 to 50 meters width in the creek and about 100 for the waterway. As, as mentioned before, observations have been conducted since 2007, at a time in which development of the waterfront was soon to start. And since then, there have been other studies by students examining different aspects of the relationship between human development and harvest seal behavior. And whereas at the creek, studies have focused on the foraging behavior of harvest seals on returning salmon. So let me give you a general timeline of events of the artificial hole outside. The Georgia Pacific pulp and tissue mill opened from 1926 to 2007. And from 1965 to 1999, Georgia Pacific released mercury into Bellingham Bay during the creation of its chloroalkali plant. In 2005, the poor Bellingham acquired the Georgia Pacific property to clean up and revitalize the Bellingham waterfront. 2007 marks the start of the Western's Marine Mammal Ecology Lab presence at the Lock Pond, monitoring harvest seals, thanks to the lead of uh, then undergrad student, Jessica Ferrer, who had learned about the re redevelopment plans for the waterfront. Her studies show that harvest seals use the Lock Pond as a holdout and popping site. Of the schedule for 2008, development did not start until years later due to the financial crisis driven by the housing bubble. And I'm afraid that many of us still remember the impact of this crisis at all levels. And the first activity then at the, of development at the pond happened until 2013 when the cleanup of the land started. And it was followed by a series of projects including the removal of the log boom, which started in mid-2015. By mid-2016, most of the logs had been removed, and by mid-2022, all had been removed. 
So the sequence of aerial photographs showed the disappearance of the log boom over time. So it's one of the good things about Google archiving all these uh, satellite photos. So this is September, 2006. Again, this is the waterway on the Northeast direction, Southwest on this direction. And this is the Georgia Pacific former plant. And there's a log pond. So let me take it out again. So all this, that was the log pond. So that's 2006. So this is now March 2016. And we see that we only have this area of the log pond. And you can see all the cleanup that happened. And this is August 2022. There is no log pond anymore. So our objective was then to examine if the removal of an artificial hollow site adjacent to a foraging site is an effective conservation strategy. We expected that the number of harbor seals haul out at the log pond and pier will decrease and that the number of seals foraging at Watcom Creek would also decrease after the removal of the log boom at the pond. So how did we go about answering these questions? For all three sites, undergrad students have conducted visual surveys and counted harbor seals. Data have been collected at the pond, log pond since 2007. That's, an, that's the supporters of the log pond. Watcom Creek since 2011, and the pier since 2017. We analyzed long-term seal count data from all three sites separately using generalized additive models, which to address the fact that many counts surely comprise the same individuals, included an autoregressive effect to regress each value to its previous observation. With the analysis, we were able to model seasonal and long-term trends in seal numbers, and the analysis of the data was carried out again by Holland Pangwell, who also led the collection of the data in 2002. She was really, she is really amazing. So this graph plots the average monthly counts on the y, on the x-axis of seals haul out at the log pond from 2007 until 2000, uh, the beginning of 2017, uh, actually until 2017. I did not have time to update this cool graph that was prepared by former Western undergrad Raven, Benko, Raven Benko, but I just wanted to show you that the log pond is a relatively small hole outside with the maximum monthly average below 70 seals and the maximum daily count that we had was under 90 seals. The graph also overlays specific construction projects described here in color that started in 2012. And I wanna point out the drop in numbers of seals in 2016, which correlates with several events, chiefly of which is the removal of most of the log boom, this bar. <clears throat> this explanation of uh, being the cause of the decline is supported by the fact that previous construction projects did not affect the number of haul out seals. Uh, the drop in number of seals made us start looking for places where seals could hole out nearby. And this is the reason why observations started at the pier in 2017. And the pier in itself is a smaller site. The maximum monthly average is under 15 seals and the maximum daily count has been uh, under 40 seals. So here is the seasonal and long-term trends in the number of hole out seals at the log pond. The y-axis represents a measure of the changes in seal numbers, higher values indicating more seals, lower values indicating less seals. The x-axis shows months and the left graph and on the right graph years from April 2000, from 2007 to April, 2023. And the shaded areas represent 95% confidence intervals. The yellow arrows point to the light times when the log boom removal occur, the two times when the log boom removal occur. The number of haul out seals at the log pond vary by month, peaking during July and August, when most people are born at the site. It also decreased over the years down to zero. Uh, this summer, there is no seals at the log pond at all. And the largest inflection point appears to have been the removal of the log boom during 2015 to 2016. 
So this graph shows a similar data, but for the peer. And as before, the y-axis is some index of the changes in seal numbers. The x-axis has the month on the leg graph, and the y-axis has years from 2017 to April 2003. Confidence intervals, again, represented by the shaded areas. And the yellow arrow points to the time when the second log boom removal occurred. Remember, the first log boom removal occurred had occurred already by the time we started making observations. The number of haul-out seals at the pier varied also by month, peaking during July, September. And it also decreased just slightly over the years, not as dramatically as the log pond, as indicated by the smaller scale and the y-axis. Actually, numbers are pretty comparable to what they have been over time. This graph shows the seasonal and long-term trends in the number of swills swimming at the Guacan Creek. And as you can see, as before, we have month on the left graph, year on the right from 2011 to April 2003. Again, the y-axis is a measure of the number of, of the changes in the number of seals. And same idea of the confidence interval represented by the shaded areas. The yellow arrows again point when the log uh, boom removals occurred. The number of haul out seals at the log pond varied by month, peaking around November when most salmon returned to the creek to spawn, but has been increasing over the years, as you can see by this graph. However, any seasonal and long term trends reflect changes in a small number of seals as reflected by the, the small scale in the y axis. So despite removing of the log boom and the total decline harbor seals at the log pond, there's still an increase in number of seals foraging at Watcom Creek over the years, doubling from a median of about four to a median of about eight per observation during the peak in November. So artificial hola removal did not appear to be an effective non-lethal deterrent of seal predation on salmon at Watcom Creek. Cover seals in the seal in the Sally Sea show a high level of fidelity to their holdout sites. At the same time, they show variability in the size of number of core areas used to forage, as well as the distance in between their core areas. So whereas some seals use, there's one example, one core area within tens of kilometers of their holdout site, other seals use several core areas separated by hundreds of kilometers. And males appear to move longer distances than females. Given that Wacom Creek is less than 10 kilometers away from the next closest haulout sites, it is likely that seals observed at the creek come from other sites to forage and explain why removing artificial haulout sites did not deter the number of seals visiting to forage on salmon. So how can these findings on the foraging college harbor seals assist with their management and the predation on, on salmon? So the findings from the first study identify sites of concern on which target management can be implemented. Regardless of the management solution employed, it seems important to target sites where salmon represents an important component of the diet and that um, is uh, sites that are also male dominated. There are two reasons for this suggestion, one is the higher presence of salmon in the diet of males than in the diet of females. The other is that sexing harbor seals at a distance is virtually impossible. I've been showing photos of harbor seals all this talk, and none of us will be able to tell whether it is a female or a male. Thus, any solution that involves targeting males will be logistically more feasible at male-dominated holdout sites. Here, I highlight the three suggested Predation hotspots for salmon based on the study, Cuts Area, Cowichan Bay, and Fraser River. However, the findings from the second study suggest that management efforts should also consider the presence of harbor seals arriving from other hole outsides. As such, actions should expand their coverage to include nearby hole outsides besides those of interest. So, what do we know? Specific on these two projects, we learned that there are differences in the diet and special distribution of female and male harbor seals in the Salish Sea. Everywhere we have looked in the Salish Sea, we have found these consistent differences between the sexes on diet. We also learned that there's um, 
at Warhol outside, removing artificial platforms did not deter number of seals foraging on returning salmon. And as usual, there's a lot more questions and things that we do not know. How do how salmon respond to this predation? And is there any indirect effects of female male harbor seals? This is a food web of the Salish Sea generated using the Ecopad software. Groups are arranged by trophic level. Connections are based on their diet. And, and the point size is just proportional to the log of the biomass. And to the point, this is a female lower, female harbor seals relative to male harbor seals. They're slightly lower trophic level that they feed. And they tend to consume more of those prey species that prey on salmon eggs and juveniles. So does that lessen the impact of female harbor seals on salmon relative to males? We don't know. Uh, where do the harbor seals come to forage on salmon? If we suggest targeting sites that are nearby a, a site of concern, how far away do these sites need to be? How prevalent is individual specialization and how facultative is it? If salmon specialists are removed, would other individuals target salmon? Um, how is it learned? Is it learned taught by mothers or, or, or learned from peers? And how do seals learn to arrive to a foraging site? Um, is there a social network that can be broken by targeting a few well-connected individuals as has been proposed for California sea lions? And are the results at the Lock Pond and Watkins Creek applicable to other sites? So I hope I convince you that studying the foraging ecology of harbor seals can provide helpful information to inform management and conservation. At the same time, that work is a minuscule part of the effort required to address the issue. I was a member of the Washington State Academy of Sciences report on printed predation on salmon. It was an eye-opening experience to interact with and appreciate the views of scientists from other fields of study and with a different perspective on the solutions to the problem. Among other things, I realized that any solutions will be difficult, will be complex, take time, and require the willingness of us to consider approaches that may not necessarily reflect our, our preferences or our first choice. So none of these studies would have possible been possible without the work of so many students from Western Washington University, from grad students helping mentor undergrad students to mentor undergrad students leading and supervising the observations of harbor seals over the years, the collection of SCAT, and the processing of the samples for genetic analysis to the large number of undergrad students who have carried out observations of harbor seals in Bellingham for more than 15 years. It is impossible to show their faces, but their enthusiasm and hard work of all of them is forever appreciated. Many institutions have been involved in this project. Western Washington University has only has supported us over the years. The first study on the diet of the uh, harbor seals uh, was conducted with collaboration, support, and both logistic and financially if many institutions, including Smith Roof Fisheries, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Long Lake the Kims, University of British Columbia, Department of Fisheries Oceans Canada, and NOAA. And the second study was uh, supported logistically by Bellingham Technical College and the Port of Bellingham. And with that, I want to thank you all for your attention. Um, cinnamon. I didn't bother to ask if people were listening to me, so I'd like to believe that they were. But so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. And do you want me to? Will you stop sharing screen so we can see yes. your face just a little bit better? You betcha. All right. Perfect. Thank you. And we did listen to you, so that is all good. Go um, <laughs> let's see if I can make you a little bit bigger here. Apparently, I can't. All right. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions, and we're just going to bounce back and forth between the folks online and the folks in the room. So I'm going to start with Roseanne. Is there any questions online? All right, go ahead, Roseanne. Excellent presentation. For the fecal DNA metabarcoding, 
I missed what genetic markers you used to identify the fish. What were they? Oh, I, I didn't mention the genetic markers. They were the ones that we used in, a, in, a, in the study in the diet of the Salish Sea conducted with um, folks from British Columbia and a bunch of other folks. The one I showed that diet data based on DNA metabarcoding. coding. So I can find that out for you in the meantime, um, but I'll get back to you to the actual markers that we use. Great, thank you. Okay, we got room questions in the room and I'll try to get to everybody, hang on. Hi Alejandro, uh, here's Clarissa, I emailed you today, so I hope we can talk more about this <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, I hope, I was wondering if you have any information on uh, how this consumption of salmon uh, varies between juveniles, uh, males that are juveniles and adults, and also if they are consuming more, uh, also if they are consuming smolts. So if they are uh, consuming salmon before they reach the adult phase. Right. Um, so the first part of the question, when you say males, oh, the male harbor seals, right? Yes. Yes. So what we're finding thus far is that so the 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 way we can know whether they're targeting juveniles or and I'm gonna say juveniles for all the different stages and adults is um is via car parts and all based on the timing of events, right? If we use uh, this the scat data. So based on that, we know that the seals are targeting juvenile, they're targeting small. The main differences that we seem to find between males and females happen with adult salmon. So that's where we find those huge differences. If we looked at the diet of seals during the, the small um, releases, then we don't see many differences between male and female harbor seals. And then the other part of your question was about whether they consume a smalt, right? So, and they do consume a smalt. We're trying to, and we as a long set of collaborators, right? Uh, to try to picture out how much smalt they're actually consuming, original estimates, such as the paper we have with Chasco, where um, uh, overestimates. So now uh, another paper we have with Benjamin Nelson uh, mentions that the actual consumption of small seems to be lower than than previously believed. So we do know that they're preying on 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 the small salmon. And we see sometimes some of them aggregating at sites where salmon where small are released. Um, such as even at Wacom Creek, one of my students did a study and we we saw some some of the seals kind of hovering around just and increasing in 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 numbers as as the small were were being released. All right, questions online. Go ahead, Roseanne. Thanks, nice presentation and great long-term data set to work with. I'm sure you've considered this, but I didn't hear if there has been a general increase in the number of harbor seals over the broader area than just the Whatcom Creek that might explain the long-term increase in swimming seals over time. Yeah, well, so I certainly agree. I think that is what is happening, uh, but I don't think there is an increase in number, but I guess, hey, let me retrace my back. If we talk about increasing the region, the larger region, if we say the Salish Sea, the evidence is that numbers have been stable since the late 90s, early 2000s the number of harbor seals have been stable. However, there's evidence of redistribution of some holdout size increasing in size, other new holdout size, other disappearing. So there, based on that, yeah, I do believe that there are seals from sites that are becoming increasing in number in a smaller region within the Salish Sea, but closer to Watkin Creek. Um, I do believe that that is happening. The closest holdout site in Bellingham Bay is besides to the creek, besides the, the pond, is Portage Island, which is at the one corner of the bay. And it's managed by the lamination. And while well, my former grad students 
mentioned just anecdotally, there seem to be more number of seals there. There's another site farther south of the bay, still within 10 kilometers, that also anecdotally appears to be having more seals. So yes, the answer to your question, I do believe that there may be more seals in the area around what can creep. But insofar as number of seals in general, if we mean the wider region, the whole Salish Sea, the numbers seem to be stable. Um, and then the first question, so this is what I have. I hope this is, was the question. So what I have here from the paper that we published is that to quantify fish and cephalid proportions, we use a 16S mitochondrial DNA fragment of about 216 base pairs, uh, which was, has been previously described by others in pin fed analysis. Um, I hope, I like to believe that answered the first question. It looks like it came up in chat. Thanks. Perfect. Nice job. All right. Questions in the room. Hello. Um, I'd like I'd like to ask uh, your opinion on if harbor seals didn't predate on salmon at all. Um, where do you think the salmon numbers would be doing? Do you think they'd still be declining with all the other threats combined, or do you think they'd actually be in recovery? Or what's your thoughts on that? What's my general take on that? Yeah. Or what yeah, do you what do you the the number of it's complicated, but it's, it's it goes at the heart of what that report by the Washington State Academy of Sciences and the call from many people about what we can do, which means targeting, harvesting, calling um, harbor seals, right? Um, it's, 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 I know that's not your question, but in a sense, it's the same idea, either they are not eating salmon or there are no seals. So if there are no eating of salmon, I think that there might be changes for some, at least for some uh, runs, for some salmon runs. So for example, maybe the Fraser River, my guess is that it might be, might receive a boost. At the same time, we do not know enough about the interactions of all those, um, the, the, the food web connections, that's what I say, the, the indirect effects. So I'm hesitant to draw a line that, yeah, seals do not eat salmon, the whole thing will recover. I wouldn't say that. I would say that for some places, some salmon runs, I that would be my, my prediction. Good, thanks for uh, trying to speculate with us. Uh, Roseanne, any other questions online? Uh, if removing the artificial haul-out sites had no effect on predation, should they be put back to allow people and students to observe harbor seals and become empathetic toward their needs? You know, I was thinking in those questions about what we do not know, I was thinking about putting that question. And then I thought, now I'm going to make the talk too long. But yeah, it's something that we have been thinking. How about then the other, the flip of the coin? If seals are coming in numbers, no matter what, why don't we do exactly what like you suggest? Then there was an undergrad student, Alisa Ice. She's not in Alaska Fish and, I don't know, Alaska Department of Fish and Wildlife, maybe they call it as well that. And she did a study surveying people in Bellingham. She did a survey. Of people, and she found that in general, the the feeling in Bellingham of people was that, yeah, it would be neat to to have. It wasn't strong, but there was, it was like, yeah, it would be neat to have seals in the area, to to do exactly what you mentioned. Um, we try to not for those reasons, but for reasons of experimental of what would happen with the number of seals. We tried this with the Port of Bellingham, this idea of can we add, and at the time there was still log boom. And we said, can we add more log booms in this other area? We knew that we're gonna be gone, right? So we said, can we add? And they looked for us and each floating log cost $10,000. That was 2016. So he said, you know, I like your student, I like you, but we don't have the budget to do that. So, um, 
I think that would be an interesting idea. I know that there were in the original plans for the Port of Bellingham, for the waterfront, there was a place with a little bit of a platform there, a lot for seals. Thanks to my student, Jessica, and other students who have been doing the work. And I don't know what has happened. since. I don't think that is there anymore, but, uh, but it's an interesting proposition, certainly. Uh, I think what you what you mentioned could happen that empathetic aspect. I also think that whoever is not liking seals already is going to like them even less. I'm afraid this is one of those conditions where, if you kind of like or understand seals, you kind of do, and if you don't, you don't. But but maybe it's true. Maybe some folks might also, as you said, become at least um, understanding and and sympathetic to that. Um, I've been also been thinking, would would it increase more seals coming to the forge there at the creek? And and I don't know. So far the study seems to suggest you put the pond, the the boom, and it might not happen, right? But it will be interesting to see. So now it's a it's a thanks for the question. I'm glad it was brought up because it was something that I was considering and including. Mm -hmm. Hi, Alejandro. This is Lee Torres. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll start my question by recognizing that I was an intern for Alejandro many, many years ago. I won't mention when, but he is a fabulous mentor and really was influential in my journey. So he really is a great teacher. Um, but here's my question is, um, what do you think is driving those um, sex bias differences at the haul out sites? And do you think those are permanent differences or do you think they might shift over time based on any number of factors? Thanks, Lee, and uh, and it's great to to hear you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I and I'm going to say to everybody. I think I mentioned it to Lee before. I use her as an example in my classes. I every time I teach my marine mammal class, like I'm going to do this fall, I showcase scientists that I think are great, young, inspiring scientists. Particularly, most of my marine mammal class is women, seventy five percent, young, bright students that are eager, and Lee is one of the scientists that I showcase in my class at the end saying, look at this scientist and all the great work that she has done. So thank you, Lee, again, for being such an example to so many undergrad students um, and other scientists. And to answer your question, um, I think that the differences, uh, they appear to be relatively stable over time, at least based on this um, sex ratio that we have been doing it. So even, even in other, other studies by other scientists um, in, in similar size to the ones we have, have, been, have found consistent six, sex bias differences. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure where it is. I, my speculation is I wonder if it is related to just mammal dispersal, males dispersing a little bit farther away than females, and then many of them coming back together, at least if maybe briefly during the breeding season or relatively briefly during the breeding season. Um, but there's evidence that at least for some sites, it seems to be relatively stable difference in sex ratio. Said that there's, we learned that there's a lot of variability in the whole out size in terms of some whole out size disappear, some whole out size increase in numbers, some whole out size the established new and and even there are some whole outsides where the sex ratio is relatively stable so i'm i'm i know i'm just kind of here spinning my wheels with your question so as i mentioned i do believe that there's part of it is that this may be a pattern of mammalian dispersal but um which yeah some of the male hull outside, no, I was thinking that some of the female hull outside seems to be relatively mud flats and estuaries, which would, and then the male dominated hull size to be farther off, which might explain that, but that doesn't happen in all areas. So to answer your question briefly, yes, there seem to be consistent for some hull outsides. No, we're not sure what creates that. My speculation is that part of it is just mammalian dispersal and yeah. 
Lisa is thank you. I took the mic away from her to just kind of say, everybody, we have run out of our time, but there are more questions online and more questions in the room. So Alejandro, can folks reach out to you directly if they have follow-up questions that they want answers to? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm you you tell me what to do. You can cut me off, you can tell me to keep babbling about or and yeah, uh, if there are more questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Great. Can you put your email or whatever address you want folks to contact you in the chat? Yes. <laughs> I'm making you do work. Um, thank you very much for everybody in the room. Thank you so much for being here. It was a great kickoff to this year's season. I appreciate it. Everybody online, thank you for joining us. And how about one more round of applause for Alejandro for giving us our talk? Well, thank you, folks. It was a pleasure. A-C-E-V-E-D-A -E -E at www.edu. And yeah, I'll be very happy to, to, um, to chat with folks. And again, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you so very, very much. We're losing you in the shadow of the sun. So I think it's a good time for us to say thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. And Alejandro, thank you so much. My Bye pleasure. Now. Muchas gracias. All right, folks online, we're going to end the presentation. Thank you so much for being here.